Thank you to our wonderful music team. It is such a joy to, to be up here and just to, to sing. Uh, I love it. Let me pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you that we can gather together in your name. We thank you that you have called us together here to be your church. And Lord, we thank you that you have a vision for our church, that you have plans for us as a group of people, plans that are good, plans to prosper us. Lord, I pray that as we seek to find and follow your vision, that our values, the things we hold most important, will match up with yours. And there will be challenges in that, Lord. Some of the things that you call us to do, we don't find easy. And so I pray, particularly as I come to the sermon this morning, that you will open up our hearts to see what you would have us do and give us the courage to do what is necessary. In Jesus' name, amen. I, I came across something that I thought was a little odd when I was going through my news feed last weekend. It was an article on Nordic walking. I know, you're probably wondering, what is Nordic walking? Well, you can think of it as, as bushwalking with poles, or if you prefer, cross-country skiing without the skis. It was a news article, but a lot of it read like an advertisement. I'm, I'm going to give you a couple of the quotes from the article. To be honest, I looked out my window and burst out laughing when I saw these people. But then I found out a bit about it and just thought it was too good to be true. I get a better workout in Nordic walking than I ever did running. When I found out about Nordic walking, I gave it a go and I found that I was able to walk so much longer in comfort and in much less pain than I could without the poles. So that was a game changer for me. Plus, the engagement of the upper body was giving me a really good cardiovascular workout as well. You get the idea. The general tone was not just, here's something new that you might find interesting, but this is a really good thing. More people should be doing this. And now my first reaction on reading that article was, wow, slow news day in Canberra. Like, really slow. But as I thought about it some more, I thought, if people can get so excited about this, which is really just walking with poles, why do we as Christians have such a problem with evangelism? Talking about something that is in fact much more important. To give you some context, we're currently doing a series of sermons on our church's values. Last week, we looked at discipleship and the idea of learning by imitation, and particularly imitating Christ. And this week, we're looking at evangelism. So I'm going to give you a quick reminder. You're going to get really tired of these slides by the end of the, of the five weeks, but hopefully you'll have learned them, right? Our vision at Ellenbrook Baptist is helping people say yes to Jesus. Ellenbrook Baptist Church will be a community of believers who individually will leverage our communal resources to impact our world for God's kingdom. We will be people who are moved by God's love, empowered by his spirit, and driven to share the person of Jesus with our communities. And our five key values are growing disciples. Ellenbrook Baptist Church will see our primary aim as the expansion of God's kingdom through the growth of disciples. People far from God. Through proclaiming God's unchangeable values and grace, we are a community that seeks to put the needs of those not yet part of God's kingdom before our own. Pursuing excellence. As an act of worship, we will aim to do the best we can with what we have available in every aspect of our church. Open hands, open hearts. Mirroring God's generosity of spirit, our members will be followers of Christ who are generous with their gifts, time and finances to make the world a better place for all. Embracing change. Change will be expected in the coming years and we will embrace God-centered change through governance, delegated management and good accountability practices. As you've probably worked out, today we're dealing with the second of those values, people far from God. And that is all about evangelism. Just 
swap the clauses around just a fraction and you get this. We put the needs of those not yet part of God's kingdom before our own by proclaiming God's grace. We hold that to be one of the five most important things. Compare that with a fairly typical definition of evangelism. Evangelism is the spreading of the Christian gospel by public preaching or personal witness. And that idea of proclaiming, preaching, witnessing is absolutely vital to evangelism. And the problem is, it's that part that most Christians find hardest. It's the speaking out bit. Uh, this is a generalization, of course, but in my experience, most Christians find the idea of talking about their faith to non-Christians, and not just talking, but promoting, saying, this is good and you should join in. This is way better than Nordic walking. We find that profoundly uncomfortable. And look, I include myself in that number. So far in this series, we've talked about discipleship and today evangelism. And I can tell you straight up, I find discipleship far more comfortable. Not that I would ever call it easy, but that's where my heart's at. That's something that I love to be involved in. Evangelism? Not so much. And there are exceptions, of course. There are people in, in every church, hopefully, who feel called or gifted for evangelism. I treasure those people. They are just vital to the health of the church. But there's also a risk that comes with that, that people like me look at people who are evangelists and we make excuses. Isn't it great that God has gifted them for evangelism? They do such great things. I'm not like that. If I tried to do what they do, I would just make a complete hash of it. Best to leave evangelism to the experts. But if you look at the Bible, that simply will not work. Simply will not work. There are people who are specifically gifted by God for the work of evangelism. Paul was one of them. He writes in 1 Corinthians, Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel. And Paul saw some of that in his disciple, Timothy. He says to Timothy, do the work of an evangelist, discharge all the duties of your ministry. And about the church generally, he says, Christ himself gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors and teachers. Which tells us that evangelism is a specific gift, but it's only one among several others. But here's the thing, Paul goes on from that verse to say, Christ himself gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors and teachers to equip his people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up. Evangelists aren't gifted so that they and only they will do the work of evangelism. They don't receive that gifting so that the rest of us don't have to worry about it any more than I teach so that other people don't have to. It's better to think of us as a resource. Evangelists, teachers, all the other gifts, they're there to enable all God's people to serve as God calls them to serve. And most tellingly of all, Jesus himself does not commit the work of evangelism only to the evangelists. Nowhere does Jesus say, Peter, Peter, mate, you are bold. You're outspoken. You are the perfect guy to talk about me in the temple courts and in all of Jerusalem. You go do that. Or to Paul, Paul, you're trained as a lawyer. You're a Roman citizen. You are just the guy to go and spread the good news through all the nations of the Roman Empire. You go do that. No. No. It's when Jesus is speaking to groups of his disciples and he says this in Mark's gospel, go into all the world and preach the gospel to all creation. In Matthew, go and make disciples of all nations. In Acts, you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. 
And I think it's significant that all of these come from Jesus' last instructions to his disciples. Jesus, in each of these cases, is about to ascend into heaven, to stand at his Father's right hand, and he is giving over his ministry into the hands of his disciples that they will continue to do what he has been doing. And Jesus' priority is the proclamation of God's kingdom, as it has been since he started his ministry. And the implications are pretty clear. Until Jesus comes again, preaching the gospel, witnessing and making new disciples are key activities for everyone who follows Christ. Evangelism is not an optional extra. Evangelism is not negotiable. It is something we must be doing if we are to faithfully follow Christ. So why do we find it so difficult? (laughs) For many people, I think, there's a sense of, I'm not trained for it. I don't know what to say, what to do, how to do it, any of those things. And I can sympathize with that, but I don't think it's a satisfactory explanation for a few different reasons. Firstly, the gospel is really not that complicated. People are complicated. The detail of Christian doctrine gets really complicated, but the gospel is simple. God created everything, including humanity. He created us to be in relationship with him. We sinned and broke that relationship. There was nothing we could do about it. So God sent his son to die, to take the penalty for our sin, that we could be restored to relationship with God and have eternal life. Now, there's probably better ways of doing that, but that's off the top of my head in 30 seconds. And I think that anyone here who wants to could learn a basic gospel outline, memorize it, inside an hour. And if there's anyone here who wants to do that, let me know because I would love to help you with it. It's not that complicated. The second point is that you all have your own story of faith. Evangelism these days is only very, very rarely about preaching and propositions. Standing on the street corner, declaring the facts and expecting people to respond. Far more often, evangelism happens in relationships with people you already know. And they don't want to know about Anselm's proofs for the existence of God. They want to know about the difference Jesus has made in your life. Your life. You don't have to be a theologian to know about your life. It's your life. You're already an expert. Thirdly, and most simply... Do you notice it's often new Christians who are often the most enthusiastic about evangelism? The most keen and motivated? They're the ones who know the least. They're the ones who've had the least training, and yet they are the ones who sometimes just cannot wait to tell everybody they know about Jesus, about coming to faith. One more reason why the not-enough-knowledge excuse doesn't hold up. And this one, I think, gets us closer to it. Jesus tells his disciples that the Holy Spirit will help them with evangelism. And by extension, that the Holy Spirit will help us with evangelism. Jesus says in Matthew chapter 10, On my account, you will be brought before governors and kings as witnesses to them and to the Gentiles, which is to the nations. But when they arrest you, do not worry about what, you, what to say or how to say it. At that time, you will be given what to say. For it will not be you speaking, but the Spirit of your Father speaking through you. And when you get right down to the bottom of it, it's that worry that Jesus talks about that stops us from evangelizing. It's not a lack of knowledge or training. Part of the worry is about what to say and how to say it. But it's not just that. The disciples Jesus was sending out, because he's talking to the 12 there, his closest disciples, he's sending them out to do ministry on his behalf. They were worried about being arrested. Jesus tells them they will be arrested. They were worried about being flogged. And against that, it's tempting to say, what are we worried about? 
What is so scary? What is the worst thing that can happen? Yes, I think the risk of legal consequences is coming closer here in Australia, but you won't be arrested just for evangelizing and you certainly won't be flogged. But we are scared. In many cases, we are dead set terrified. We're scared that people will think less of us. We're scared that we'll be ridiculed. We're scared that we will lose relationships that are precious to us. So look, we're happy to support missionaries. Sally Pym, Jono and Heather Crane, all those lovely people, let's back them. We're happy to pray for evangelists. Anything at arm's length is fine. But the idea that we would do it ourselves that is scary. And incidentally, I think that's actually reflected to some degree in the programs that we have as a church. The two biggest things we're involved in outside of our Sunday services are the Parenting Grove and Ellenbrook Meals. Both super important, both things that we are solidly committed to and I would not change. But they are both focused more on building connections. They're both focused more on what we call pre-evangelism rather than evangelism. Going back, though, to what I was saying before, I think there are times when caution is appropriate. Let me say that. Our relationships are important. They do matter. And often it is better that people see us as Christian within a healthy relationship than we damage that relationship by being insensitive, overly forceful, unloving, in the way that we present the gospel. But I do think often fear makes us overcautious, too timid. I suspect people are more resilient than we think. People are more resilient than we think. They might not agree with us, but most people will not cut you off just for talking about your faith. And it's worth calling out that fear, that fear of other people, the fear of rejection, the fear of scorn and ridicule. Call it what it is. Sin. It's sin. That's putting it bluntly. But as Christians, we were made for better. If we surrender to fear, if that stops us from doing what God wants us to do, then we have fallen short of God's expectations. And that is sin. Pretty much by definition. Have a listen to what Paul writes to Timothy. I think this one's actually worth hearing in full. This is from 2 Timothy. To Timothy, my dear son, I remind you to fan into flame the gift of God which is in you through the laying on of my hands. For the spirit God gave us does not make us timid, but gives us power, love, and self-discipline. So do not be ashamed of the testimony about our Lord or of me, his prisoner. Rather, join with me in suffering for the gospel by the power of God. He has saved us and called us to a holy life, not because of anything we have done, but because of his own purpose and grace. This grace was given us in Christ Jesus before the beginning of time, but it has now been revealed through the appearing of our Saviour, Christ Jesus, who has destroyed death and has brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. And of this gospel, I was appointed a herald and an apostle and a teacher. That is why I am suffering as I am. Yet this is no cause for shame, because I know whom I have believed and am convinced that he is able to guard what I have entrusted to him until that day. Paul's writing there to Timothy very late in Paul's ministry. He's probably under house arrest in Rome. Not entirely sure. He knows his time is coming to an end and he is writing to encourage Timothy. We're worried about what people will think, but Paul reminds us that human opposition is no cause for shame. It's God's opinion that really matters. If we go back to Jesus' instructions to his disciples in Matthew chapter 10, we find this verse, which is both a promise and a warning. Whoever acknowledges me before others, I will also acknowledge before my Father in heaven. Can you guess what the other part of it is? But whoever disowns me before others, I will disown 
before my Father in heaven. If that doesn't scare you a little bit, you probably weren't listening. My concern is that a large number of Christians have let themselves be swayed, worn down perhaps, by secular society. We know that the gospel is no longer welcome news to many of our neighbours, family and friends. But have we let that trick us into thinking the gospel is no longer good news? We know it's no longer welcome news, but does that mean it is no longer good? Paul writes in Romans chapter 10, Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. How then can they call on the one they have not believed in? And how can they believe in the one of whom they have not heard? And how can they hear without someone preaching to them? And how can anyone preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. Now, Paul was under no illusions about his popularity or the popularity of his message. He's writing in that chapter about the Israelites who rejected his message. Still, he can say, everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved, but to call they must have believed To believe, they have to hear. And to hear, someone has to preach. How many of us these days would think of evangelism and go, how beautiful. How beautiful. We need to recover that. And to put behind us any thought that news has to be welcome or popular in order to be good. That is a lie and we need to kill it dead. News can be good, even when people don't want to hear it. Instead, let's ask, why do we do evangelism? Leaving aside Jesus' command for the moment, what is our motivation? Think about those Nordic walkers that I started with. Why do they talk about Nordic walking that way? Because they believe that what they are doing is good, and they want more people to do it with them. It's pretty much the same for us. We evangelize because we believe that what we have in Christ is good and we want more people to have it too. In fact, I would go so far as to say that we evangelize to the extent that we believe that what we have in Christ is good and to the extent that we want others to share it with us. Often when we say that what we have in Christ is good, what we're talking about is salvation. We evangelize because we want people to be saved, brought out of the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of God's Son, no longer under the wrath of God, but having eternal life. And that is good, but there's more to it than that. What we have in Christ is not just salvation, but a relationship with God, with Jesus. What we have in Christ is good because He is good. That's the crucial point. This is the point John Dixon makes in his book, Promoting the Gospel, that we should evangelize not only to save people from hell or to get them into heaven, but because our Lord is good, the highest good, the goodest good, if you'll excuse the terrible grammar. He is worthy of all praise and honor. So we evangelize not just to tell people about a process, about a rescue that's there, but about a person. We tell them about the rescuer, the person of Christ. And this, to me, is a big part of the answer when it comes to moving beyond our fear. Just as a pragmatic point, it shifts the focus. If we talk about hell, we worry that people will think us judgmental. If we talk about heaven, we worry that we'll think us half mad. But the person of Christ still commands a measure of respect. More than that, though, I think that keeping our focus on Jesus is important for us. It means that we have the right priorities, the right motivation. It brings faith out, not fear. The other part of the answer that Dixon gives is actually there in the title to his book. He talks about promoting the gospel rather than proclaiming the gospel. And that's a useful way of thinking about things because it is often in the speaking that people have the most difficulty. Now, obviously, if we're taking Paul or 
or Jesus seriously, then there will be times when we have to speak. When we have to tell people so that others can hear the good news. But being a witness for Christ is broader than just speaking. We are promoting the gospel if we live in such a way that we make Christianity or Christ attractive. That's one of the reasons why it's so important that we love one another, because that is attractive. If we live that way, it opens doors to speaking the truth of the gospel. And that ties into what I was talking about last week, about evangelism coming out of discipleship. If discipleship is the process of becoming more like Christ, and we are striving as Christians to imitate Christ, then a life of discipleship is already a witness. Let me give you an example. Last week, I was speaking to some Christian friends of mine. They're a little bit older than me. Uh, They've been Christians for over 30 years. And the wife of the couple was telling me that their lawnmower man had recently become a Christian. And the reason she gave me, the reason this guy has become a believer, is because they gave him a bottle of champagne to celebrate every Christmas. Not necessarily a strategy I would recommend. (laughs) I wouldn't necessarily suggest uh, evangelism by alcohol as a general tactic. That seems a bit amiss. But you can kind of see where it's coming from. They have had a relationship with this man over a number of years. In the course of that, he has been able to see that for them, Christmas really is something to celebrate. And that part of that celebration involves generosity to others. And that has moved him to investigate Christianity and has brought him to faith. Now, I'm sure that at some point they have shared the gospel with him. I'm sure at some point they have spoken with him about their faith. But part of their witness is simply in the way they live their lives. So, you can be a witness for Christ and promote the gospel, even if public speaking makes the proclaiming bit hard. Let me close by saying this. As a church, we value evangelism. The Bible makes perfectly clear that while some people are called and gifted as evangelists, we are all called to the work of evangelism. There is no getting away from it. We are expected to proclaim the good news and serve as witnesses for Christ. And many Christians struggle with that because, frankly, we get scared. Evangelism is frowned on in our secular society. In some places, proselytizing, as it's sometimes also called, is actually prohibited. And we're worried. We're worried about what people will think of us. And that will not do. That will not do. We are called to live in faith, not fear. And there are things we can do to help. We need to remember, we need to actively call to mind that it is God's opinion that matters, not our popularity. That is a scary thing to do in our culture, but it is true and we need to remember it. We need to remind ourselves that the gospel we have to share is good news because Jesus is good. Even aside from the question of heaven and hell, Jesus is worthy of our obedience and our best efforts. And for those who really struggle, remember we can promote the gospel without words by living in such a way that it bears witness to the work of Christ in our lives. This, everything I've just said, in a sense, that is the best answer I can give you when it comes to evangelism, but I am deeply conscious of the fact that it is only a partial answer. In a sense, it has to be. If I had a better answer to the fear of man, there's a good chance I wouldn't be standing here. I would be out on the street talking to people about Jesus. It is that important. So this is an an area in which I would like to grow, personally, And it is an area in which I would like us to grow as a church. The more I think about it, the more I think it would be good to have a training day of a sort so that everyone can learn a gospel outline and we can have a chat about some of the ways that we can engage with secular culture. But I would love to hear from anyone who has practical suggestions of how we might get over our fear 
and reach our communities with the gospel of Christ. That is a genuine request. I am very conscious that this is not my strongest area of gifting, and I would love the input of our church here about how we can do this better. So please come talk with me. I'm going to close in prayer, so I invite our music team to come back up. Heavenly Father, your word tells us very plainly that we are to be witnesses for Christ, that if we are following him and uh, living in obedience to him, then we are to proclaim the good news, the good news that salvation is available, that the, uh, the work of Christ on the cross has won a great victory. And Lord, we find that really, really hard, many of us. Not everyone, but many of us, and certainly I do. And so, Lord, I pray that you will strengthen us because your spirit is not one of timidity. Your spirit is a spirit of power and of love. May that love for other people and our love for Jesus, who is good and worthy, may that draw us onward out of our comfort zone to share with others the good news that you have placed in our heart. To speak of the life that you have given us. In Jesus' name, amen.